Well, many thanks again to our musicians and thanks to Jeremy for reading God's word and praying for us this morning. The context is Romans 1, or 6, well, 1 to 14. We're actually going to focus our attention on verse 11, but as we begin again, I'm actually going to invite you to read with me once again verses 9 through 11 of Romans 6. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Pray with me once again. Your word is true. It is powerful. And, O oh God, by your Spirit, I pray that you would seal that word on our minds and our hearts in deep, profound, even eternal ways this morning. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. On the 1st of September here in this area, we faced one of the worst hurricanes that our nation has ever known. In our area, there were tornadoes of speeds of 150 miles per hour, sending massive trees into the sides of homes like a hot knife into a stick of butter. The swelling of the Schuylkill River reached record proportions, and some in those areas had flooding in their homes, not only filling up their entire basements, but even their first floors in their homes. It was objectively a mess. And I want you to envision this scenario. Somebody who has suffered such damage makes a call to their insurance company and files a claim. And here's what they hear in response. We know what your policy says, but we now have a different view. We've adopted a new meaning for the word flood, for hurricane, for tornado and damage. I'm sorry to inform you those words don't mean what they used to mean. Get with the times. Well, such redefinition is preposterous until it's not. We are in the midst, I would say, in our own contemporary culture of a moral and spiritual storm waving, raging havoc on our hearts and one of the primary tools of cultural and moral revisionism is redefinition. Words now mean things they didn't used to mean. And redefinitions of sin and self are at the center of that storm. Richard Dawkins asserted that the Christian focus overwhelmingly on sin, 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 sin what a nasty little preoccupation to have in your life, he writes. The freelance author Hilary Brand says, it is clear that the word sin is in trouble. In fact, the use of the word is frequently dismissed as a bad thing in itself. In the redefinition of sin, we have decided in our culture and society that sin is in the view of the beholder. We all see things differently. I don't see sin like my pastor, my aunt, my mom, my neighbor, even the Apostle Paul. We are actually, after all, aren't we, a learned people? We have learned how psychology and sociology have demonstrated that morality changes. Words change, meaning shifts, morality shifts. And this redefinition of sin, of course, is one of the tools that demonstrates the moral revisionism at work in our own society and indeed in our own churches. It's interesting now that certain companies have adopted even the seven deadly sins as names for ice creams. One company decided to use this sort of language for their campaign. Pleasure is everything, give in to happiness, Reject propriety, embrace variety. Prudence is so, 1658. Life is fleeting, clasp it with both hands, seek delight, trust your impulses, 
ordinary is pointless, break free. Well, these distortions, of course, could not be more perverse. They also could not be more mainstream. And as we come to the book of Romans and we see how the Apostle Paul addresses the matter of sin, it is for him, to borrow a Sir Walter Scott metaphor, it is for him, no wax nose. Paul would see the redefinition of sin as a manifestation of Romans 1, the, the suppression of the revelation of God. Paul has crisply defined sin in the book of Romans as a violation of the law of God, the revelation of God. It is unrighteousness before the righteous God who has spoken. As our Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it so succinctly, what is sin? Sin is any want of or conformity to or transgression of the law of God. That is truly Pauline. As theologians have helped us understand through the years that sin is actually a positive evil. Now, that doesn't mean that they are in favor of it. What it means is that there is actually something very aggressive. There is a personal activity of sin. It is not merely the absence of good, but a mighty force which exerts its domination. Sin and death are the objective enemies of God. And as Paul lays before us the whole scope of redemptive history in Romans 1 and following, we discover that there is a cosmic reality of curse and sin and death, a universal stranglehold. Sin is a real thing before a real God who really judges it as Paul lays before us. What we find in verses 9 through 11 of Romans 6 is the objective historical truth about what Jesus Christ has done about it. Read again verse 9. Now, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Christ Jesus has died to sin. Our text identifies this objective foe, a real enemy, a reigning authority, a positive force against which no one has ever stood until Christ Jesus. Sin is therefore no more a wax nose or a psychological or emotional construct than is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, mythical or ideological. Jesus, as Paul will lay before us, truly and objectively and historically overwhelmed sin by his own death. In his death, he killed death, as John Owen has so helpfully helped us to grasp. And as Jesus Christ died to sin, we, we understand that in his death, he has crushed not only the guilt of sin, but its power and its dominion. See, the problem with the redefinition of sin is not just moral revision, but gospel derision. It destroys the gospel itself for the Christ who came, came and gave his life for the real sin of real sinners and overwhelmed that sin in his own righteous life, death, and resurrection. You see, redefining sin is a rejection of the good news. People are not just broken, needing a therapist. They are sinners who need a savior. And that's what Paul lays out before us, that this sin is a revealed thing. It is not merely a humanly conceived thing. Well, as we think about that redefinition of sin, that lays the framework for what I really want to focus on in the next few minutes. Because as we consider the disaster of the redefinition of sin, we also see that the redefinition of self is an essential corollary. Paul is concerned here in Romans 6 that we understand who we are. 
or identity. As we think about the redefinition of self, I I want to just do a brief survey of the the last several decades in American history. Not all of you are from the United States of America, but I think it's important for us to understand the various moments in American history, how the lust for self-interest has blazed out of control and how that has happened. We've seen originally a slow glide into moral, moral relativism, but it is now accelerated to speed skating. If you think about the American lingo around the, do- the Declaration of Independence, the, the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these things have become a perverse justification for self-gratification. Let's just go briefly to the 60s. 60s were arguably a period of unprecedented progress as well as unrestrained progressivism. 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. In 1969, one of my earliest childhood memories was when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he said. But historians, when they look at the 1960s, see that as an age in which the American populace nearly lost its mind. Even secularists will claim this as they bear witness to the fact that in the 60s we became more tolerant of individualism and self-expression. Woodstock certainly typifies this. Campus demonstrations, the birth control movement. And in 1968, Bill Galston of Brookings Institute described it this way, this age is a combination of race, gender, and Vietnam that produced a lethal cocktail. But if we think about the mindset, the collective mindset of that age, I would argue that we had a a, a mindset that was about questioning authority. Who are you to tell me? what to do. Well, as we move that into the 1970s, bell-bottom jeans, the environment, the founding of the EPA, give a hoot, don't pollute. Some of you will remember that from Richard Nixon era. The rise of feminism, the Equal Rights Amendment, the convergence of sexual freedom and political activism. This was when streaking became popular on university campuses across the country. If the 60s were defined arguably by question authority, what we find in the 70s is a little bit more virulent. Not only question it, but challenge it. Not only who are you to tell me what to do, I'll do what I want to do, I dare you to stop me. As we get into the 1980s and 90s, I would say that we see a massive shift, and even in terms of the educational institution and the way in which we would actually see the fruit today of a reader-centered hermeneutic in which the text no longer communicates, you actually introduce meaning into the text through the likes of literary theorists, of Stanley Fish and many others. Meaning is created, it is not received, rather than just questioning authority and challenging authority, I'm now claiming authority. I'm in charge, I decide. Well, if I can accelerate into the 2000s for the last 20 years, I I would suggest that we have seen a dramatic move from even that broader social construct of meaning being constructed by a group, by a community, to us as radical individuals who perceive reality as something that we make. The locus of meaning has shifted to self-expression. The authority movement is now shifted to the locus of me. What Augustine and Luther described as in curvatus in se, turning in on myself. But I want you to think reflectively with me just about all of that movement. The American dream, I can do what I want to do. 
He came, I can be what I want to be. I can think what I want to think. I am who I think I am. I am who I feel I am. I am who I say I am. I am who I am. Does that sound familiar? That's the very language by which God identifies himself to Moses. I am who I am. The tyranny of our cultural moment, I would suggest to you, and the rise of the modern or psychological self, as Charles Taylor will put it, is actually a rise of gross idolatry. Identity idolatry drips with arrogance. And the relevance of what Paul argues here in Romans 6, I would say, could not be more poignant. Look at verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Did you know that we come all the way to Romans 6 and verse 11 before we find the first language of imperative in the book of Romans? The very first thing that Paul is concerned that his readers understand is that we see ourselves as God sees us, that we interpret ourselves through the lens of the success of Christ in crushing sin, Satan, and death itself, that our self-understanding reflects divine understanding of ourselves. That's where we start. Note, Paul writes, so you also must consider yourself dead to sin. Note that also ties us back to who Christ is and what he has done. We are pointed to Christ who died for real sin and its cosmic stranglehold, its enslaving power and authority. This paradigm that Paul is calling us to is to a yielding to the voice of God, the revelation of God in our self in interpretation, our self-understanding. We are pointed to the historical facts of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We are pointed to the theological, cosmic, and personal, and covenantal significance of what God has done for us in Christ. Christ defines who we are and how we should think of ourselves. We are to think of ourselves As in Christ. Look at verse 9 again. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Notice that once for all is actually the springboard by which Paul in the following verses in verses 12 through 14 calls us to recognize the power, the significance of what Christ Jesus has done as it bears upon his people. We do not think of ourselves rightly unless we see ourselves in Christ. We must yield our self-perception to divine authority, yield to what God says is the efficacy of what Jesus Christ has done in his own death. And his once for all is for us all who belong to him. Consider yourselves dead to sin. What does Paul mean? He means we are to consider ourselves in view of the success of King Jesus. The language of dominion is woven through this text by which sin exercised mastery. Sin exercised enslaving control on everyone, everywhere, at all times. And Jesus Christ came and crushed the power of sin and death on behalf of his people. He is now alive to God because death no longer has dominion over him. Don't miss that language. Death no longer has dominion over him. Paul is saying there is a stage in redemptive history in which Christ in his humiliation comes to a world that is under divine curse. The impact of sin and death is everywhere as Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus. 
weeping, angry at sin and smelling the wafts of the stench of death into his nostrils. He's enraged because of the sinfulness of sin, the horrid nature of death itself. Sin had dominion over Christ until Christ crushed it with his death. Death suffered a lethal blow in the death of Christ. As John Murray will describe this, he then in his death and resurrection has made that once for all decisive breach with the power of sin and death. Christ is never to die again. He has entered into a life unto God. It is that eternal life of which John the apostle speaks. The life he lives, he lives to God. So, too, must you. How do you see yourself this morning? What is your self-conception? See, how you think of yourself reflects on Christ. Because you are in him. If you think of yourself as an alcoholic Christian, then you must think of Christ as an alcoholic Christ. So is the language of union. If you think of yourself as a gluttonous Christian, you think of Christ as a gluttonous Christ. If you're a sexual addict, if you are one who struggles with same-sex attraction, do not define yourself by your sin. Define yourself by your Savior. And this is where Paul calls us to deny the redefinition of sin and the redefinition of self. Paul is not saying that there is not ongoing battle with indwelling sin. You heard that very well last week from Dr. Poirier. What he is saying is that our victory over that is secured in Christ Jesus. We have everything we need for life and godliness. Why? Because we are in Christ and he lives to God, so too do we. What he is saying then is that those sins do not hold us. They do not define us. They are not our master anymore. For us to claim that they are is to claim the failure of Jesus Christ. Christ does not offer an add-on, a therapeutic remedy. He offers us himself in his own victory. Some may protest, well, that's just not authentic. My struggles are real. My temptations are real. This is who I am. You talk about redefinition. What God calls us to here is an authenticity that is defined by him. We are not defined by how we see ourselves. We are defined by how God sees us. And in that, of course, raises the compassion question. This seems so unkind to those who struggle with sin, who struggle with same-sex attraction or some other identity idolatry. Where is the love of God in that, you may ask. Well, you or someone you may know perhaps are struggling with a stubborn sin, even a sin related to your identity and your self-conception. And you find it unloving and lacking compassion to demand such a perspective in the view of the challenges. But I urge you not to allow your notion of compassion or your notion of love to be perverted by yet another contemporary redefinition. There's no love in affirming others in a paradigm that defies the power of Christ over sin. There is no compassion if we let somebody actually believe who is a brother or sister in Christ that they are reducible to how they feel. That lacks compassion. In this destruction of death and power and its power, Paul lays out for us the most compassionate framework for thinking about self. Look again at verse 11. So you also, just like Christ, 
So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Contemporary author Mandy Hale has started a movement, particularly among women, or at least ridden the wave of a movement that is arguing, as she puts it, you are enough. You are enough. All you need is you. Nancy Guthrie helpfully responds, convincing ourselves we are enough is not an answer to our emptiness. It is not more of ourselves that we need. Many of you know I grew up in North Carolina, went to the University of North Carolina, went to school with Michael Jordan. Great memories. <laughs> Michael Jordan has has been proven in basketball history. There's no one who was a better player. Happy to have that debate, by the way. <laughs> Michael Jordan's life is actually epitomized in a story that came out just a few years ago in a series of interviews that he did in which his security team that traveled with Jordan, maybe still does, with him wherever he goes, they all carried two-way radios, and each of them had their own handle, their own ID for that radio. With little embarrassment, Michael Jordan's handle in that two-way radio posse, he calls himself Yahweh. I am what I am. Michael Jordan, if you know his life now, is characterized by a man whose life has been turned on himself. He's desperate, he's lonely, it's tragic, and it is not more of himself that he needs. We live in an age in which you are taught to believe that you are enough. That is not where God takes us. He shows us that Jesus Christ is enough. He is enough for your temptation. He is enough for your identification. He is enough. As Dr. Poirier put it so wonderfully last week, sin is no kitten. It is a lion. It doesn't bat at you playfully. It bites you ferociously. It doesn't meow. It roars. It does not nibble. It devours Sin is not something that comes alongside you as a friend. It comes to master you. Sin is that indomitable foe, that taskmaster, that wicked, evil king that reigns over all people in all places at all times until Christ Jesus. His death defeats death. The lion of the tribe of Judah has devoured the jaws of death and risen victoriously. And it is that Christ to whom you are tethered for eternity. To think of yourself then in terms of your past sin or even your present battle is to make a mockery of Christ. It is to say a no to his yes. It is to say to him, no, you didn't, you couldn't, you didn't conquer sin and death. You did not make me a new creation. You have failed, but what of it? Shall we attempt to reverse Christ's sin-crushing, death-killing death and resurrection by our own finite, fickle, and falsifying hearts? Shall we define ourselves by the new societal, societally contrived view of self? Shall we allow the demands of cultural redefinition to propel us to the arrogance of redefining sin and self and therefore defying Christ? You know what Paul says to that at the beginning of Romans 6? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still identify ourselves with it? Christ's death
is victory. So you too must consider yourself in the victor. You are a child of God by grace through faith, bound to Christ and therefore free. And it is the God of heaven who is the great I am who declares to you what you are. Graciously, clearly, compassionately, with life-giving force, he says to us this morning, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Praise be unto his name. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, how can we begin to fathom the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of your love for us as your people. We thank you for your great compassion. We thank you for the victory of Jesus Christ over the power of sin that was once our master that devoured us and confirmed us in eternal death. And we thank you that we are no longer in the first Adam but in the last. We thank you that we are a people who by your grace through faith are given the full bounty of provision of heavenly blessings in Christ. We thank you, O God, that you have given us yourself and to you we are tied for all eternity. So, O God, help us as we navigate this life, navigate this world, as we are tempted to think worldly thoughts and accept redefinitions, make us not believe the lie that therein lies compassion but rather may we discover afresh the glorious kindness and beauty of gospel grace that we are no longer under sin but under grace because we belong to Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.